Hello and welcome to lesson 16 of the 21 for 21 podcast, bringing you all the latest on sports and media. I'm Stuart, back in the presenter's chair this week, joined as ever by Jamie. And for our special Winter Olympics preview episode, my colleague, Megan Tandy. Megan, thank you for joining us. Yeah, thank you for having me. Glad to be joining you and it seems pretty fitting with the Olympics right around the corner. Yeah, no, that's certainly the... I mean, I've been looking to get get you on for, for a while, because as well as being a, a great member of the team here at Iris, for those watching on YouTube, we've got three um, Winter Olympic clothing. Clothing's in the background. So Megan is here to talk to us about the upcoming Winter Olympics, both from the sponsorship point of view, uh, touching on what she's been doing with us at Iris, but also with her time as a biathlete. So, yeah, Megan, I guess our first question is, um, for those of you our listeners from from England, what is a biathlon? <laughs> that is a fair question. Right. So I do live in Germany, but I'm from Canada. So especially when I was first starting my journey in sport and biathlon, I got that question a lot. Um, biathlon is the sport of cross-country skiing and rifle marksmanship. Rifle, mark- rifle marksmanship sounds fancy, but it, it's shooting. Um, so for anyone who's really not familiar with the sport, it's awesome to start with, but you literally race around on cross country skis on, you know, a ski course with a rifle on your back. And at given periods, you come to a shooting range, whip your rifle off. And with your heart rate at somewhere around 180 beats per minute, you um, shoot five little targets down. For every target you miss, you ski a penalty loop, which of course is, takes, detracts about 20 seconds of time from your race time. The interesting thing is in Central Europe, people will laugh to even hear this description because it is the number one winter sport, very much beloved, very much known. But um, from Canada, yeah, as I said, we're much more of a ice sport nation. And I myself didn't know what biathlon was until Canada won the bid for the Vancouver Games. And we started getting funding for non-mainstream sports like biathlon. So biathlon... Well, I think in the Olympic Games in general, both the Winter and the Summer Olympic Games, there are these sports that are, are kind of contrived almost to be a sport. Whereas this this kind of almost kind of like it sounds like from a hunting background, I'd imagine that, you know, you have to combine these two things in a in a practical sense that there's now becomes sort of sports size, if you like. Am I, am I right kind of in thinking that? Yeah, I mean, it has an army background, too. There were literally oh, army troops on skis. Um, in different ports in history. So you're right. It's not a made up sport in that sense. It's got a real, a real life background to it, which does kind of make it interesting and does give it, I think, in some areas, a really long and deep history. Yeah. I mean, it's not often in uh, in, in the real life, as it were, you'd, you'd come across 22 men kicking a ball around a field for uh, for any practical purpose other than, than entertainment or competition. Um, so how did you get into it as a, a sport, Megan? Um, I think there was the main driving factor was actually the Vancouver um, Olympics. So, you know, what happened is Vancouver applied. We eventually won the bid. And suddenly what happened was, as I mentioned before, there was a lot of funding going into Canada in general, also into British Columbia. It's a home games. And of course, like any country, we wanted to put on a good show in all of our sports, not just our strong side. Um, So at that point, I was 16. Um, was living in Prince George, which is in British Columbia, but about 700 kilometers um, northeast of Vancouver. And the funding was there to start recruiting and run a high performance program. And I had already been a cross country skier. My dad hunted. So, you know, shooting wasn't a foreign thing to me. It wasn't something where you're like, oh, is that safe? Um, I'd done biathlon at our local club and I, I applied for the program started. I think I cried a lot in the first three months because high performance sport was a whole different world compared to the hobby sport I'd been doing before. But I think I had a lot of luck. Um, I have quite an endurance engine. Certainly that was my strength as an athlete. And the program really changed my life. Um, It was my entry into the high high performance world. And, you know, after a few years, I was at my first nationals, first world junior competitions. And in 2009, um, as I was still a junior, I managed to qualify for our Olympic team in Vancouver. Was it was a quick, a quick trip to the top, um, came in very much as an underdog, had a lot to learn those first few years, 
but it was actually a very cool thing that funding really opened a lot of doors not only for myself that sounds yeah it sounds really really great and a really exciting uh time in your life and and to be able to come away with uh, those sorts of stories um you kind of grabbed my attention we'll get it in a minute uh, i guess Stuart, in, into kind of how we get into the sport media side of things and how you made that step from from competing in sport to kind of looking at it from from the other side megan uh I, I read in the news recently, I've, I'm in Barcelona and Catalonia are looking to bid for the 2030 uh, Winter Olympics in the Pyrenees, which are, of course, you know, sort of a, a three hour drive, four hour drive from Barcelona City, uh, which is quite incredible in itself. You can go from sea and beach to mountain and snow within half a day. Um, and what one of the things they're doing is they're running quite a lot of uh, kind of surveys and consulting a lot with the local population before they kind of put together their bid and make anything official and i think actually in spring they're going to give uh, residents of the area a chance to vote on, on whether or not they want the winter olympics everything points to, to yes they do and um, so i'm just kind of wanted to ask you a little bit maybe and and you've kind of touched on it already because you said um you know how what, what an opportunity it created for you but just kind of that idea of living through the the funding the bid the, the seeing your country kind of take that step into this kind of world stage for the the winter olympics i mean from my perspective it was incredible but we've got to see it through my eyes i was a young athlete like i cried for happiness when we were on the bid because it, it was so amazing like the olympics were in my backyard and the year before the games i was able to train and live at the olympic facility so I had the opportunity during those Olympics, you know, go home and sleep in my own bed or, you know, drive 40 minutes to the athlete village. So for me, it was an incredible opportunity, but I do feel like it's fair to look at the bigger picture. On one side, you've got funding, you've got, you know, the global platform, the world is looking at you. You've got development and a potential to leave a really positive sport legacy for a host city. But you've also got the potential that a lot of money flows into the games and you've got to ask the question, you know, what's the benefit for the people? Are the locals getting something out of it? What is the real legacy that's left for them four years down the road or eight? Are they, you know, are the taxpayers still paying for the Olympics or have they truly got lasting benefit? Um, and I, you know, it's really, I love talking about like, you know, the Olympic values and the passion, and the love of sport, but there are other aspects to it that I believe need to be examined and re-examined. Of course. And, and here in Barcelona, the 1992 Summer Olympics, uh, there's still a legacy from that. There are still pools open and stadiums and things that, that are still in use. And, and people seem to work quite hard to keep them in use. It, you know, it's sort of, we've got this facility, what can we do with it now? Kind of vibe sometimes. Um, do, do you kind of get a feeling of any of that from from the Vancouver Games? Yeah, um, certainly a bit. I mean, firstly, that's amazing what you just said about Barcelona. It's so happy to hear. And I think Beijing touches a little bit there too, right? They have had a summer games before. They've got some of the big facilities, you know, opening ceremonies are gonna take place in the revamped version of the original um, host facility. So it's really great to see that kind of, some elements of sustainability and, you know, legacy kind of rolling over coming in. Um, Vancouver is in part the same. I would say the city facilities, the arena facilities are absolutely a legacy that are used, that are loved, that are there for development athletes, that are there for elite athletes that are hosting other events. However, to be fair, we have other facilities that have, you know, they're not abandoned, they're cared for, they're used, but they're not necessarily living the dream like they could be. Um, for example, ski jumping isn't something that's a huge deal or we don't have a lot of traffic. So we have training camps there. We sometimes have guests. Um, certainly the ski club that's active there applies for events every now and then. But it's something that takes a lot of effort to maintain. And I think there needs to be a structure behind that that looks at the legacy and says, OK, not only do we have this great facility, but do we have the volunteers and the know-how and the funding to operate it? Do we have the program? Do we have the athletes and the interest to make something of it? So it's really interesting to follow those stories and, you know, look back. I mean, it would be interesting in itself, I guess, just to look back at many different Olympics and see 25 years down the line, what kind of legacy have they really left for the people of that country or that area? Yeah, so I think the the first Olympic Games to have a terrible legacy in terms of funding and public facilities was Montreal Summer Olympics. So I guess that was always in the 
in the news in the preparation for Vancouver. Uh, so I guess my next point is, so obviously you uh, got into the sport properly as part of the Vancouver training program. So then what happened next was your training camp in 2011 in a four-star hotel, not a five-star hotel, or how did the athletic um, legacy continue because obviously you were in, in the next two Olympics as well. Was there a lot of differences you noticed in terms of the the training and the interest in, in amongst your people in Bank, uh, British Columbia? Um, yeah, so that's a really interesting question. I'm actually so glad you asked it, and it plays a huge role in my personal life too. That question leads us to how I came from Canada to Germany. So legacy in terms of interest from the Canadian people or just North Americans in some sports like my own sport biathlon, that is absolutely a lasting interest. We have more coaches, we have more funding, we have more competent programs that have truly, you know, they got their initiative from those games and the funding that went into that. However, in the short term, it there was certainly an element of, okay, like games are over, money's gone. Um, and that was what happened to me. The pre training program that I was part of um, lost their funding post games. And, you know, it was the question for me, uh, what's next? Staying with the Canadian national team, which would have meant a move um, away from British Columbia, which wouldn't have been a problem in itself. But, you know, I needed to find a new hometown and a new training facility. Um, in the end, um, I had a German partner and I ended up moving to Germany. Had that program continued, I certainly would have, you know, stayed home in BC. So yeah, definitely some things, there's a sharp fall in funding post games and it really comes down to the organizing committee itself, every individual games, how much planning and effort goes into the legacy aspect. And I see it in a really positive light that the IOC is putting more and more emphasis on the legacy and it's no longer a nice to have, but an expectation. So I think something we've we, we've touched on on before, but so maybe I'm getting the the timings wrong. But it was in the run up to the Sochi Games that you first began to take an interest in in more the sponsorship side of things because you had to source source your own sponsorship. Did I get that right, or did that come? I mean, even later. No, no, that I mean, in a way, it was always true. Um, as a Canadian biathlete, you cannot call your sport your career unless you have personal sponsors. Um, that's just part of the game. And it's something that takes a lot of athletes off of national teams. You know, you reach a point where you're like, okay, should I be looking at my education? Should I be looking at other options in my life? Or is this working for me right now? You know, acquiring personal sponsors, pursuing sport. You do receive some federal funding, but it's not enough to live and train on. Um, so from that perspective, even pre-2010 Olympics, um, I had my first sponsoring interactions. Most it began with equipment providers, you know, your skis, your poles, and your racing on sponsored equipment. Um, it moved on to some local businesses who, you know, was suddenly cool to have a young athlete in town who was going to be going to a world juniors, et cetera, and, you know, gained, gained momentum from there. Once I moved to Germany, um, I was in a completely different environment because I had essentially lost the support of the Canadian national team not in the theoretical sense, but very much in the physical sense, you know, my teammates, my colleagues, um, training camps, everything was far away and in a large part inaccessible to me. So for me to be able to successfully run my own training camps, you know, whether we're talking about three weeks at altitude for a given period of time, going to a glacier training camp so that, you know, you've got enough kilometers of training on snow before the season starts, those kind of things all needed to be funded through personal sponsors. Um, and so, yeah, it was absolutely a part of my existence to make sure that that worked. And had it not worked, uh, it would have been a career ender for me. Just as, as you were talking then, there was just like glacier training and, and altitude training and stuff. And I'm thinking, wow, you know, like cyclists for the Summer Olympics, they just go and ride their bike. <laughs> <laughs> or they come to Mallorca or, or, or Catalonia. Um, so did you have to sort of develop skills to find and manage your sponsors and how kind of how how did you distribute your week if, imagining like i don't know a 40 hour full time job although i imagine it was trading and preparation and managing sponsors probably nearer to 60 hours uh, a week how did, what was your, kind of your split in terms of like training competing managing sponsors making sure that you had enough uh, money coming in to be able to kind of live um well i would say the schedule of an athlete from that perspective very much 
runs over a year. Um, the springtime is, was for me always sponsor time. You know, your season has just ended. You've got results, may it be good or bad. Whatever you're going to do, you need to make sure that you have some financial basis to start the next season. Um, without that, you can't realistically plan training camps. April is in general for the Nordic winter sports, kind of essentially a month off. You do some maintenance, which generally means like 10 hours of physical activity per week. And it's your gain a few kilos, eat what you want, relax, sleep in time before it's back to the grind in May. And so that was definitely the time of year when I really was like, hey, yeah, this is this is my business month. I'm going to set up my season right now. So I absolutely developed skills. Um, I did have support along the way, but I had, you know, a brochure and I approached companies that I thought we could have a benefit beneficial mutual relationship with and when I first started seeking sponsors before I was really in a position to be like okay I might not be a top athlete but look I'm here I'm in the world cup I'm in these different countries exposed to these different media sources let me put my your logo on my rifle or my hat initially my offer was like okay I'm gonna come and give cross-country ski lessons to your employees I'm gonna come give cross-country ski lessons to your employees kids I'm gonna come to you know to whatever it may be to your to your Christmas party or to your summer barbecue and I'll be your keynote speaker tell motivational stories run icebreaker activities with your customers so um, I very much ended up being asking myself the question what have I got to offer and it took some time for me to develop the confidence to be like okay I'm not on the podium every every weekend in fact in my entire career I never made it onto the podium at the World Cup but I do have something to offer. I do have a value system. I am out there visible, but not only visible, I am out there representing with pride certain values and I'm representing my country and a certain level of, you know, just determination and grit and, you know, just that sport feeling. Um, and I feel like that was worth a lot. That was what in the end, that was what sold, so to speak, because I think it was really genuine. And most of the companies that ended up supporting me were people that, you know, that passion burned for them there for a little bit too. They're like, yes, we believe in you. You are honest. You are hardworking. We are honest. We are hardworking. We're going to back you. And I mean, that was a pretty, pretty incredible to discover that I could initiate those kind of partnerships. So from what you've learned since you've been working 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 in iris for a few months ago do you think the sort of sponsorships you were getting were more relevant to you and, and you were, in terms of the building the relationships and offering practical skills or if you were to be an athlete now or advising athletes now do you think that data could have played a stronger part in your hunt for sponsors than it did i think it could have played a stronger role than it did yes but I think the main question that needs to be asked is what do both parties have to offer? And the answer may be, I'm a top athlete. Uh, what I have to offer you is millions of, you know, hits on social media channels is so many hours of your logo being broadcast during live events or during world-class events. And that is measurable value. And I've learned so much about how we track that, how we assess that, how we evaluate that. Um, during my time at Iris, but it may also be that, you know, you are, an, uh, let's say, an underdog team, or you are a team that's kind of in the top league, and then you're back down again, and there's a value proposition there, too. The question is just what it is. Maybe it's not the broadcasting time of the logo. Maybe it's the association with the never give up attitude. Maybe it's the loyalty. Maybe it's the relation to a certain region or area that someone has, you know, right a, lo a loyalty to their hometown that brings a company and an athlete or a team together so I do think it's always comes back to the baseline what are you what are you able to bring to the table for each other because I think sponsorships that are set up mute as a mutually beneficial partnership for both um, I mean that's where it needs to go yeah I think certainly the skills that took you from being an athlete having to find your kind of your sponsors and and the funding to continue being an athlete to where you are now in, in iris and we can look back on on previous episodes with Stuart or with peter and to know a little bit about iris and, and what they do i think those that skill set is quite clear that the way you kind of uh if you you fit in there if you like 
do you want to quickly take this opportunity just to talk us a little bit about what you do at iris because obviously Stuart knows but i have no idea <laughs> and our listeners definitely don't know um so just sort of really quickly just to, to give us an idea of where you are now Okay, well, I'm a sales manager for IRIS, right? That's um, intelligent research and sponsoring. And IRIS's main focus is we optimize sports sponsoring activities, be it by media research, market intelligence, market research. And for me, it's a really cool position to be in because my job is literally to use, whether it's using my network or just my genuine interest in the winter sports world, it's having interesting conversations with federations, with athletes, with sponsors, with hosts, with organizing committees, all these different players on the platform of sport, if you'll say, and I get to have interesting conversations with them and find out, okay, you know, who is this actor? What are they trying to achieve and how can we help them? Because the question is always, they usually know why they're there and what they're trying to achieve And the question is, okay, you know, who are your fans? Who are you reaching? In which geographical area do you have the most potential? How can we bring, you know, the fans, the sports, the sponsors, how can we bring the right people together in the right way? And so, yeah, of course, we're selling data and data related services which is interesting, but what really makes me passionate about it or really interested in it is you always see where the benefit is. You know, it's not like we're selling Tupperware or like a vacuum cleaner. I mean, having clean houses is a benefit too, but I mean, you can really see where it's going. You're like, okay, this is so cool. If these guys can activate the sponsoring campaign and this way they're gonna be reaching their target group, the sport is having the benefit they've got, you know, a new partner on board who maybe really fits the kind of feel and the values that that sport wants to portray so it's really yeah um it's really exciting i guess no no you transmit that and you know firsthand how important it is to get the the right partner or the right sponsorship on on board so i think like that's um a really exciting step for you and and certainly you transmit that excitement and that passion yeah so we first sorry to make we've first spoken quite quite a bit um in uh previous episodes about networking and, I, and i've always asked our guests do they have a, a killer tinder style opening line in networking but what 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 you have is you have those three letters o-l-y after, after your name so you have the uh that, that injury hook that proof that you are you've been there you've competed at, at the top level and most importantly therefore you know your stuff about sport i think there's one more aspect to it too like I do think it's true what you just said about those three little letters, but there's one more thing they transmit. And I don't necessarily say this to toot my own horn, but because that's how I perceive other Olympians, you know how much work it is. If you see someone with that O-L-Y behind their name, whatever they may be for a person with whatever preferences or, you know, activities in life, you can pretty well bet your money on it that they are a bloody hardworking, determined person. And when I see someone else, a fellow Olympian in the sport business field, I usually mark them as someone like, okay, whatever else they may be, this is someone who's like hardworking and, you know, I can go to them and if they say they're going to do it, I bet they're going to do it. So that's, that's a value I personally associate that. And it's pretty cool because, you know, I've been noticing as I've been, let's say, expanding, expanding and growing my network in particular since starting at Iris, um, there's lots of you know, Olympians in the sport business world and former athletes. And it's a very cool opportunity to, you know, get in touch. So, yeah, so focusing again back to back to the, the upcoming uh, Olympic Games, of course. So um, from our sport media perspective, I, I have no doubt that pretty much every every athlete competing is going to be recording podcasts right now to talk about their hopes and their chances for the Games. Uh, do you think back from your time in Vancouver 2010, do you think there's been a huge change in the, in the media lam- landscape around athletes and the w- Winter Olympics, would you say? Um, yes, I do. But I don't think it's Winter Olympics specific. I think it's the change in landscape that is, you know, hit the entire world. And it's just the topic of moving from TV to OTT. It's the topic of everything moving online. It's the massive social media following and it's no longer just a social platform. It is truly a content providing platform where there's an incredible value to be given and had 
depending on how people choose to activate their sponsorships or position themselves. Um, when I first came into the sports sponsoring, you know, stage of my career, I mean, that's why I made my Instagram account. I was like, okay, well, you know, this Instagram is a thing. Some of the sponsors kind of want to be, have a post on there. I'll start an account. And today it's a completely different world. You know, it's, if you're not present in those social media circles, you are probably missing out on a massive opportunity to communicate with potential customers, to communicate with fans, a massive amount of exposure. So I would say that that has touched winter sport and winter Olympics as it has every other field. There's an element, and I, I quite like watching pro athletes with vlogs now. Um, and it seems now everyone's got, well, a lot of them have got them. There's an element now that, and, and maybe it goes back to what I said before about how you manage to sort of distribute your time in terms of like training, competing, finding sponsorship, managing your your sponsors and stuff. Now there's an extra element that you have to be a content creator as well. And is that something that you felt, I mean, I guess sort of 2014 was kind of the, the rise of Instagram. Twitter was pretty big by then. Was that something you felt? And is that something that you've seen that that these athletes having to kind of diversify their talents, especially I think in the Olympic and, you know, the summer and winter Olympic games where maybe athletes can't afford to have a team of content producers and, and publicists and PR managers around them, like, like we see in other pro sports. Yeah. So that is exactly what I would have said is that, um, you know, you have a certain percentage of athletes who are on a level of professionalism where they do have content creators working with them or for them and then you have the rest right. of the field who as you say they're we're becoming content creators ourselves because that's simply a necessary element of marketing yourself and giving something back to the sponsors and partners who make it possible to do what you do so yeah certainly i've experienced it so many times with myself or my colleagues where it's like oh man, we, you know, we're going to catch the bus back to the hotel at 10, 15. Can we really hurry? I've just, I have to take this picture today, you know, and it's not like, oh, grab a selfie on the way by. It is a job, you know, you know what you need to do. You know what kind of content creation is on your must do list to fulfill commitments or, you know, to keep certain doors open for yourself. And yeah, certainly that's on the list of every athlete. Um, certain certain media presence, certain content creation, certain making themselves available in certain ways. I don't think it's all bad, but I do think that um, a lot of athletes wear a lot of hats, so to speak. Is there things that you see that are done well or things that could be done better by athletes that are kind of running their own communication campaigns? And maybe yeah. Stuart might have a, a bit of an opinion here as well from what you guys see at Iris too. Um, I mean, my gut feeling that I also kind of feel like is sometimes unfair, but I mean, that's life, is I do think that there are certain personalities who enjoy putting themselves out there. And I think it's a lot easier for those personalities, regardless of their sport performance, to promote themselves and have an online presence. And I personally know several athletes who are truly incredible, hardworking, talented you could, you know, if you looked at them externally, you could be like, I know how I would, you know, market you or present you or what you could post in an instant. But that's not them. You know, maybe they're a little introverted. Maybe they don't love putting them out there. So I do notice that there's athletes like that where you do feel like they're missing out on potential. It's hard to avoid because, you know, it shouldn't necessarily be required to put your life online in order to pursue your sport. But to a certain extent, um, it, it is, unless you've got the results to, you know, generate the support without having some sort of personal presence. Um, other than that, there's certainly just a very, very wide range of interests. And one of the things that I feel like is extremely positive about athletes having a stronger media presence is it gives athletes a platform to support causes that they believe in. Um, and you see it happening in the widest variety of sports and the widest variety of social causes, whether it's gender equality, whether it's water uses, whether it's climate related topics, whether it's political themes, people are able to use their platforms to speak up for what they believe in. And they're also able to seek out sponsors and partners who share those views. And I think that's a really powerful thing too. Uh, do you think, so either maybe you've heard her heard rumors or even seen this confirmed but in terms of 
the selection of athletes versus certain less funded sports is some athletes with a higher social media following being picked over those with who may be better at the sport but le- less prominent on social media or is that just me so, being, being cheeky from my face what you just said and putting two and two together um i hope it's just you being cheeky maybe i have too much trust in the systems that govern our sport but i think in terms of olympic qualifications i mean i know this from myself for sure the olympic qualification regulations come out and you've got that 50 page document printed and you're highlighting every section like you're going to know every word of that thing if you want to qualify for the olympics and i think in most sports there's very clearly dictated qualifications um i think that it's very unusual for personal opinions or a coach's role to come into it and i do think it's much more challenging in sports where it isn't just based on the numbers where there's an artistic element where there's you know a team Um, teamwork element to consider certainly that makes it a lot harder and the potential for those kind of let's say unfair decisions or external factors to have an influence is higher Um, fortunately in my sport career I was always in a sport where the numbers spoke either you won or you didn't you were either within a three percent gap to the leader or you weren't so I've personally never been faced with that kind of discrimination so the reason I I asked is I was going to say, Jamie, the uh, the gymnastic sisters who went went to our school, they had a big uh, selection issue in the, in the Summer Olympics. And that, again, that's an artistic, it was sort of the coach's choice rather than a specific entry level of, of qualifications. That's another reason why that, that, that uh, question came to mind. Yeah, I think that's yeah. an incredible pressure. Um, you know, you really put yourself under the microscope, not just your performance, but you're judged as a person, you're judged as an athlete, you're judged in terms of your results. And that's the nature of high performance sport. Um, there's nothing to complain about there, but it's certainly, certainly not always easy, especially at games time. Yeah, there must be. So there's two things that occurred to me as we were talking about this, that when they come to the, the selection committees, it would be very easy to say, OK, this athlete's getting great results and everything, but they're not at all visible. This athlete is not quite as good, but they would bring a lot more visibility to the sport and to our country. And because they've got this amazing social media presence or whatever, and you'd hope that, that you're like, you say that doesn't come into the factor, but it would be difficult for the, you know, a committee that they're still passionate about the sport. Don't get me wrong. I'm not, I'm not being um, kind of skeptical or, or, you know, that, but that to have that, other element of saying look hey we can give much more exposure to the sport if we go with this athlete regardless of their results you know it's it must happen they must have these conversations and really really hard because I mean that breaks my heart just like thinking about that I'm like that is so wrong yes the Olympics are this is business there are commercial aspects but at the same time like it is supposed to be about sport is it supposed to be about bringing humans with a passion for sport onto a fair and equal playing field and let the games begin. But we all know there's more background factors to it than that. And I think that's where we get into some of the topics about the Olympic advertising. You know, the IOC charter has rules that are specifically designed to try to keep the Olympics as a neutral platform, whether that's not allowing um, sponsors from personal outside of the Olympic sponsors to play a role, like trying to control the commercial activities in association with the games. Athletes are also limited. I mean, everyone involved is limited in terms of what they're allowed to express for political, um, social causes. Like, ah, it's a complex process, and it's really hard to keep it pure because, I mean, there's just too much going on. But yeah, my my athlete heart doesn't want to doesn't want to hear about selection based on based on social media presence. I'm just like, no, no, let it be about sport. But the reality is those are also topics that need to be sometimes put into the light and examined, make sure that qualification criteria are clear and fair. Well, I think it's it's not even spoken about that much in pro sport that I don't know, Messi going from Barca to PSG is or, or Ronaldo's move. Those players add a lot of value to their to their signing because they have such big audiences on social media and you know there's there's certainly an element of their worth that's happening off the pitch you know it's um so yeah i i don't know about it within olympic sports i, I can't comment and i utterly hope like you say that it's not the case but um certainly in pro sports i think it's one of those things that, that is very obvious but people are not necessarily talking about yeah yeah absolutely 
I want to ask, uh, or Stuart, do you want to jump in at, at that point? Or no, I, mean, I, was I was quite conscious. Just, just, ask, ask Megan. So sorry, from a so you've got you've probably got your three uh, Olympic outfits from the last three Olympics behind you. So what are you most looking forward to about the upcoming Beijing Games? Now you'll be watching it on the couch or analysing it a bit for Iris. What are you most looking forward to this time around? <laughs> We were going to ask the same question, so there you go. <laughs> good. Um, <laughs> Sorry, Megan. <laughs> no, and it's all good. I think I really am looking forward to looking at it from the couch. I mean, it's not that I'm not looking forward to it from a professional perspective, but it's kind of weird. You know, I've got all the feelings these days. It's so nostalgic. I'm watching teammates and people I know, and also just people I don't know. You know, it's one, I qualified for the Olympics, or I didn't story after the next. And, like, everyone hits me because, you know, I've lived that and breathed that three times. Um, so I think I'm looking forward to really soaking in all of the games from the perspective of a sports fan, because I've never been in those shoes before. And when you're there, you know, maybe you think, ah, oh, the athletes, that's incredible. And they're, they're in the center of it. Yeah, you are. But at the center of the games is athletes who eat, sleep, hide in their hotel room so they don't get sick. So they're well rested for their events. Um, and are really, you know, got the blinders on because they're there to perform. And I think it's going to be cool to watch all the events, to follow all the news. Um, yeah, of course, it'd be cooler to be there. But I'm I'm looking forward to viewing it from, from another perspective. Perhaps biathlon is especially so. There's certainly some sports, you know, I guess we were always a little bit jealous, the cross-country athletes and the biathletes, because we have so many events and our sport dictates that a certain amount of recovery time occurs between events, given it that it's an endurance sport. So generally, the events are spread out during the entire field of the games. So if you have your last event one day before the closing ceremony, you like get to the finish line and you're like, okay, I've got to go to these three parties. I've got to visit the other Olympic village. I've got to see this thing. I've got to go to the Austria house, the German house, the cat, like, you know, you've got this, all this olympic life to soak in that you've been you know abstaining from for the previous week so that's that's a funny aspect of the olympics too before we get to the final question which we always ask i want to ask if there's anything from a sport media perspective that we should be looking out for from this uh, winter olympics hmm yeah, that's a good question. I don't have a straight up answer to that one. Um, I think one of the things I'm looking forward to is watching how China handles the marketing of their own Olympics. I'm really interested a little bit post games, actually, in a topic to kind of go back to the beginning of our conversation. They've got lots of sports where it's been similar to my experience with biathlon, where funding has gone in. They've got great coaches. They've got programs coming up, but they're kind of, let's say, non-native or non-mainstream sports for China. I'm really interested in watching the legacy, what happens after these games, if they're really able to breathe life into it and, you know, see the trajectory in winter sport um, continue. Great. And so to, to finish off, Megan, so I, I was the guest last week and I forgot this is the question we ask everybody, and I think I even <laughs> forgot to to remind you to, to prepare one. So, uh -oh. you know, have a, 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 any any lesson for sport and media in the twenty first century, based on your time as an athlete and your time working at Iris? What what would that would that lesson be? You know, I think I would say, in keeping with the Olympic spirit, the lesson would be to be genuine, because there's so much data, there's so much commercial influence, but what it all comes back to about sport is human emotion that's what drives this entire industry at the base of it it's the human emotion that's connected with the you know the grit the blood the sweat the tears the loyalty the failure the success you know all these aspects of it they you know pump up the emotions in all of us so i think whether whatever side of it we're on whether you're a fan whether you're an athlete whether you're a partner um i think being able to enter the field of sport media with with a genuine you know as you are i think that has a lot of value and i think in today's world we need um transparency and genuine people and genuine companies great i think that's i like that as a lesson yeah. thank you <laughs> sums everything up very very nicely so megan uh thank you very very much for your time and from my point of view we'll speak tomorrow but uh jamie you got to <laughs> 
no no absolutely i i this is um it's been a different episode but i've really enjoyed it i you know I've not get many opportunities to speak to an olympian so uh thank you very much for for taking time out to come and talk to us and uh, certainly a lot to take away and a really really interesting story and things that i hadn't even considered about how athletes have to find their own funding and sponsorship and what 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 an ordeal that must be really uh so yeah thank you very much for sharing that with us so so sincerely and openly you're welcome it was a pleasure great so from a publicity point of view just follow uh, iris sport on on linkedin we'll be bringing all, all the all the latest insights throughout the games uh, megan any your, your personal accounts are they still active for any any winter sports fans wanting to look back at your, your, your I mean, moments? If you take a scroll through my Instagram, you'll definitely be able to scroll back to Olympics. But no, I don't have active social media accounts right now. But I can second, follow Iris, 22 <laughs> interesting facts for the 22, 2022 Winter Olympics. Um, we'll be waiting for you. And other than that, just, you know, enjoy the games. Well, brilliant. I certainly will. And uh, especially more so now, now that I've got this uh, different way of seeing these how these athletes compete. Megan, thanks very much for joining us. Thank you to everyone for listening and join us next week for episode 17. Thanks very much.